Hi Kay. Welcome to you. Oh sorry. I'm in such a rush tonight that I forgot to share. I forgot to share the usual promo. We can't have that, can we? There we go. Here we are. There we are with my Patreon account. And this is a potpourri about Trump, the Assange trial, tribute to Kevin Zeese, and the progressive uh, prospects, or reasons for hope anyway, if we do get a Biden administration. So let's get back to what we were doing. There's Carmen reporting on deck squabs. Squabs, such a funny word. Hi, stoners. Kay says, glad to see you. I'm glad to see you, Kay. Stoners, as in followers of Dr. Firestone. <laughs> I never told you the story about my uh, statistics class. which I prepared for on the plane. I taught a statistics course once. I prepared for it on the plane out to Honolulu. It was for summer school okay, at the university there. And they asked me to teach a course in uh, statistics and I'd never taught one before. So I prepared for it um, on the plane. The first thing I encountered when I got there and this was back in uh, 1968. And the first thing I encountered when getting into the class was a stoner. <laughs> the only stoner in my class. <laughs> in 68, stoners were just getting going. With, uh, with Woodstock. And the war in Vietnam protests. And a lot of good things coming out of the 1960s. Hey Dolores, how are you? Please share, share, share this everyone as much as you can. I think I'm going to start to cover things because there are a lot of things to cover. So the first thing to cover, which you're seeing all over the internet today, by the way, is of course the release by Woodward. Yeah, Bob Woodward released some tapes for his new book on Trump known as Rage, Rage. And in the clips that were released from his tapes by the news media, uh, what they found is that Trump had admitted on February 7th that he knew from talking to uh, to to President Xi that uh, he knew that COVID-19 was five times worse than the most stringent uh, flu virus than even your strenuous flus, he put it. And not only that, he admitted that the virus is passed along as an aerosol 
and quote, you just breathe the air and that's how it's passed. And so that's a very tricky one, tricky one. That's a very delicate one. It's also more deadly than even your strenuous flus. This is deadly stuff, unquote. That was February 7th. The administration did not declare the pandemic a national emergency until March 13th. And on March 9th, he tweeted, President Trump did, so last year 37,000 Americans died from the common flu, unquote. And quote again, it averages between 27,000 and 70,000 per year. Nothing is shut down, life and the economy go on. At this moment, there are 546 confirmed cases of coronavirus with 22 deaths, think about uh, that. So four weeks and two days earlier, on February 7th, uh, Trump um, already knew that it's five times as fatal as the flu, he said the flu averaged between 27 and 70,000 per year. So figuring you split the difference at 50,000, Trump knew on February 7th, this was likely to kill 250,000 Americans. And yet, he took no decisive action against it, no national plan, no asking people to mask. No shutdowns where there should have been uh, shutdowns. He didn't do what other national leaders did. He did not um, shut down travel to the United States. He did not cause people to quarantine when they came in okay, to the United States. He didn't do any of that stuff. And 30 days later, okay, on March 9th, he was downplaying it. He was downplaying it. And he was lying about it. Ten days after the sending the March 9th tweet, that's March 19th, he remained unwilling to publicly acknowledge that the virus couldn't be transmitted through the air and continue to downplay the need for a public mask uh, rule or mandate. And he's quoted in the tapes as saying, I wanted to always play it down. Quote, again, I still like playing it down because I don't want to create a panic. I just want to create a panic. What kind of panic? What kind of panic? Was he talking about a stock market panic? Did he maybe not say anything to people on February 7th because he wanted to give he, his family, and his cronies, time to get rid of stocks that they uh, held perhaps in industries and areas of the economy that were going to be vulnerable to the pandemic. Maybe that's why he kept critical details secret for so long, which by the way, is another reason why we must prevent any future president from retaining their investments in private industry if they become president of the United States. Those investments must go into a blind trust. The president cannot know what he or she is invested in if they become the president of the United States. If that means that rich people won't want to serve, so be it. 
rich people won't want to serve. But that was the wisdom of the Constitution. The Constitution has not only a foreign emoluments clause, it has, in effect, what's a domestic emoluments clause. Trump has abused his power. He has used insider information to divest himself of stocks. And you might say, I don't know that for sure. Right. I don't know that for sure. Would you like to make a little bet that Trump and his family did not divest themselves of stocks between February 7th and March the 19th? Would you like to make a little bet about that? A key force that key forecasting model by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at University of Washington now predicts 400,000 deaths from COVID by January 1st. But we don't have 400,000 deaths now. We don't have 400,000 deaths now. We have only 196,000 deaths now, according, according to the Worldometric, or the Worldometer site, okay, I should say. We have 592 deaths per million in the United States, which has given us 196,000 deaths uh, right now. And by the way, Trump just said at a rally, he just said at a rally that our deaths are going down. They're going down. Guess what our deaths were yesterday? Guess what the deaths were yesterday? They were 1,021. I don't see them going down. There's still over a thousand a day. Five hundred ninety-two deaths per million. We're now definitely past uh, the Italians. So Trump said to people, he said, "Oh, we're doing better than the eurozone countries. We're doing better than the European Union countries." Right at this moment, in deaths per million. We're doing better than the UK, which is a 612. We're doing better than Spain at 635. We're doing better than Belgium at 855. At 855. But there is something like 30 nations in the EU, 30 nations in the EU. That's only three nations that we're doing better than. And we're catching up to the UK pretty fast. So that's where we are. So Trump lied again in a speech he made today. He lied again. Remember when we were just catching up to France? France is now at 472 per million. We again are at 589 per million. And remember when we were catching up to Sweden? I'm sorry, we're at 592 per million. Sorry, I misquoted that. Italy's at 589. Okay, remember when we were racing to catch up to Sweden? Well, they're at 578 now. We're at 592. We've raced right past them. Right past them. But let's get to the really important issue here. The really important issue is what might have been if Trump had shut down the United States to foreign travel for a while, or at least quarantined all visitors coming in, And what might have happened if he had contact traced and tested vigorously? What might have happened if he invoked the Defense Production Act 
and made sure protective equipment was available in very short order. And he started doing that at the end of January, as he should have, or even before. He knew this was a serious threat even in the beginning of January. But even if he had started at the time he shut down travel from China, if he put in a whole range of measures on that particular day, what might have been? Let us learn something about that. Australia, a culturally similar nation to the United States, has 31 deaths per million. They've had a little bit of a rough time lately. If we had 31 deaths per million, because we had managed things as well as Australia has, we would have only had 10,261 deaths by now. Whereas today, our total deaths were at 196,259. So, we would have had 186,000 less deaths than we have now. What if we had managed as well as Japan? They have 11 deaths per million. If we had 11 deaths per million, we would have only lost 3,641 people right now. That means we would have had roughly uh, only, we would have saved 193,000 deaths compared to what we have now. What if like South Korea, we had only seven fatalities per million? Then we would have saved 194,000 deaths. What if we had managed as well as New Zealand? Then we would have had only 1,655 deaths. We would have saved roughly 195,000. What if we'd been really, really, really great like Thailand? That has had only 0.8 fatalities per million. Then we would have lost only 265 people. We would have saved, in other words, 196,000 people, almost all of our Americans who have died from COVID. And if we had been as good as Taiwan, close to the very best in the world, we would have lost only 99 people. Again, we would have saved 196,000 people. So that's what might have been if Trump had not lied and if he had put together a national plan and if he had listened to his advisors at the end of January. That's what might have been. Anywhere from 186,000 to 196,000 deaths might have been saved. Might have been saved. But oh no, not by Donald Trump. Not by Mr. Oh, I've managed this wonderfully. I've done a tremendous job. Don't you know what a tremendous job I've done? Only most nations in the world have done a better job than I have done. I mean, I've done the ninth worst job in the world. It might have been worse. I might have done the worst job in the world. I got news for Mr. Trump. If we reach 400,000 by the end of the year, He's going to be at something like 1,100 fatalities per million. And that's going to put him at 
That's going to put them worse than Belgium and worse than Peru is now. Now, Peru is moving fast, so they might still be number one worst in the world by that time. But in that case, we will be number two worst in the world. And Donald Trump will be able to boast about that. I was almost number one. Almost number one worst in the world. He was out on the trail boasting today. How we're going to turn the corner tomorrow. Wait till next year. Doesn't he sound like the Brooklyn Dodgers back in the 1930s when they were known as the bums? They lost every year. It was always wait until next year. That's Trump. Wait until next year. There was a quote from Ilhan um, Omar, whose father died of COVID in June, and she responded to the revelations by Bob Woodward. All I can think about is, quote, all I can think about is my father and the nearly 200,000 other people who lost their lives to COVID-19 as a result of this president's gross um, negligence and lies, unquote. She tweeted just yesterday, and quote again, Trump had the power to save lives and went out of his way not to. If history is any guide, there will almost certainly be no immediate consequences for Trump due to the revelations in Woodward's book, because of course there won't. We have reached the point in U.S. politics with the Lord God of hosts. I'm quoting now from an article by William Rivers Pitt. In truth out, I quoted a number of times from this article thus far. It was written today or published today on September 10th. And this is a particularly juicy part. We have reached the point in U.S. politics where the Lord God of hosts could descend from heaven on a pillar of fire, denounce Trump from atop of uh, uh, um, uh, um, Everest in a voice audible throughout the universe, and Trump's fiercest defenders would wave it off as, quote, fake news, unquote, even as Mitch McConnell gavels God out of order. The House may do investigations and the media's editorial rooms will shake their collective fists, but consequences are not on Trump's uh, menu until November. This is a filthy truth, a hard-earned understanding after all these long years, another throat full of bile to be swallowed. And then Pitt says, Bob Woodward, however, is another matter, as the criticism of his decision to withhold COVID data from the public for months erupted. The author told the Associated Press, quote, that he needed time to be sure that Trump's private comments from February were accurate, unquote. Six months of Trump's vividly public evasions and 200,000 COVID debt dead strike me as more than enough primary source material to sound an appropriate alarm. Hashtag Woodward New was trending explosively on Twitter yesterday after details from the book hit the wires. Quote, for reasons of their own, venal, selfish, and inexcusable reasons, all of them, both Donald Trump and Bob uh, Woodward, shirked the duties of their respective occupations and eventually Hundreds of thousands of Americans may be dead in part because they did. Thunder Esquire blogger Charles P. P. Pierce, Charlie Pierce, quote, the shame of this should be everlasting. Okay, I have to say 
that I kind of agree with uh, with uh, William Rivers Pitt. Okay, about this. He ends his article by saying that nonfiction book authors in particular should take notes since the publication timelines for books tend to be long. Although we aren't doctors, we journalists would do well to abide by the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. And Woodward, by holding off for, some long, for so long, has done a great deal of harm. One person who disagrees is Bo of the fifth column. He had one of his um, short pieces today defending Woodward, suggesting that what Woodward does is he does a form of detailed okay, narrative um, a journalism which takes a long time to develop, to create the story. In other words, it's the narrative and the story which is so effective about his particular journalism. And Bo says, look, we all knew in February that Trump uh, was lying, that he wasn't really telling the truth. It is not that kind of revelation that we did not uh, um, actually know it. We did know it. If Woodward had come out uh, right then in February and told what Trump had told him on February 7th, says Bo, it probably wouldn't have made a big difference anyway. Trump most probably would have spun it and done what he intended to do, and there would not have been the impact we think there might have been. I really don't find this view convincing. What Bo relied on here was his understanding of the type of journalism that Woodward actually does. It's patient journalism, it's long-term journalism. It's accurate journalism. It relies on interpretation and storytelling. And that is Woodward's profession. So he was basically being true to the kind of journalism he does in holding this out. For me, that does not really suffice in this situation. I think the public had a need to know what Trump said on the very night of February 7th. We all needed to know what things have been different. Trump might have tried to spin it, but between February 7th, um, and now, there was plenty of opportunity to impeach Trump. On February 5th of 2020, the Senate voted to acquit President Donald Trump on two articles of impeachment, marking the historic and inevitable end to a bitterly fought, divisive impeachment trial. Now what? What if this were revealed on February 7th, that Trump 
was lying about um, the COVID, that he knew the truth by February 7th, and that he was hiding it from the American people. Would Nancy Pelosi then have turned around and rammed another article of impeachment through the House and sent that up to the Senate? I think she might have. What Trump did in misdirecting the whole country for months was very, very important. Killed thousands and thousands of people. Killed thousands and thousands of people. She might have been dissuaded from shutting the door on impeachment for the rest of the season had this come to light. Maybe the Republican Party would have acted in an entirely different way as well if the news had come to light in February or early in March. How can Bo know? I can't know, and you can't know. We can know that news like this is likely to have a major effect on the political process. I don't think you can blindly assume that Trump would have spun it and it would have been forgotten about. Not as the death toll mounted. Not if he still went down the same path that he's gone down. By the way, if the news had come out then, he might have decided to do something else. He might have decided it wasn't really politically tenable to deny that he knew the truth early in February. Nobody knows that. I'm afraid I don't agree with Bo on this one. I do agree with William Rivers Pitt. I think he's right. But I also want to emphasize the main issue here is not the blame that, uh, that Woodward has. I mean, Woodward is not the president of the United States. He could not have done anything directly about the management of the COVID uh, crisis. That responsibility belongs to Donald J. Trump. If the COVID crisis had turned out well, he would be all over it grabbing the credit. It has not turned out well. It has been a disaster for the United States. It has killed, it has killed more of us than we lost in Korea, in Vietnam, in the Iraq wars, um, in the Afghan wars. in all the wars since World War II. And it's not over. By the end of the year, we'll have approached the death toll of World War II. All incurred in less than a year's time. So, let's move on to the next subject. So, we've all been concerned about, do progressives really have a reason to hope, considering what Biden is doing with his uh, transition team, 
and the kinds of names we're hearing from articles about the transition team, the kinds of people he's appointing, the kinds of people he is not appointing, do we have reason to hope? So Bob Kuttner takes this up in the prospect on September 9th. I did not link to this one. It's a short column. And the relevant quote is as follows, quote, the leverage that progressives have is in the progressive logic of the political moment. If Biden wants a big turnout for his campaign, he needs to be for big change. And that's true once he takes office. So quoting from what Bob Kuttner said, if he runs as one more Wall Street beholden centrist or one more cautious moderate on race, turnout will suffer. And if he governs as a centrist and little about the life prospects of working people changes, Democrats will get blown away in the 2022 of the the midterms in 2000, okay, in 22. He might have said just as they were in the midterms of 2010. But then he goes on, that's the leverage progressives have, which is not to say the fights over personnel and policy won't be trench warfare. They will. So that's the thin read that Bob Kuttner wants us to hold on to. That uh, the logic of the situation will push Joe Biden to be better to be more progressive. So the question I would ask is, did it force Obama to be more progressive? Did that logic force Obama to be more progressive? Did he force him to put through a recovery act that had $1.8 trillion focused on high multiplier things? No. He passed an $800 billion bill that was focused on quite a bit of nonsense. Did it force Obama not to, um, uh, to govern as one more Wall Street beholden centrist? or one more cautious moderate on race? Or did it force him to run that way? I don't think it did. Did it force Obama to govern as a centrist and to create significant changes in the lives of working people? No. Obama sold us out and kept our pitchforks away from the Wall Streeters. And Democrats were blown out in 2010. So that leverage is not enough. We need more leverage. We need a third party movement. We need to build one. We need to keep on building the progressive movement. We need to elect uh, more progressives to Congress before the end of this year. There are progressives in Texas we could elect. There are progressives that we can still elect. Cory Bush we can still elect.
There are people in Rhode Island we can um, elect. There are progressives in California we can um, elect. We need more progressives, more members of the squad. We need to get them in. And then we need to work hard to get in others by 2022. Biden needs to feel their hot breath on his neck as he goes forward. So, let's move on now to Julian Assange. There's an article called The Stalinist Trial of Julian Assange. It's by John Pilger. It was written on September 7th. It appeared in Counterpunch. I am going to share this one. There it is. See how it looks. I hope you're sharing. I hope you're sharing. So, if you've been following the Assange trial, okay, at all. You can see what a travesty this is. Uh, John Pilger, who's a great journalist himself, okay, a great opinion writer, starts off, when I first I was introduced to Assange more than 10 years ago, I asked him why he had started uh, WikiLeaks. He replied, Quote, transparency and accountability are moral issues that must be the essence of uh, public life and uh, journalism. Unquote. John Pilger says, I'd never heard a publisher or an editor invoke uh, morality in this way. Um, um, Assange believes that journalists are the agents of people, not power that we the people have a right to know about the darkest secrets of those who claim to act in our name. If the powerful lie to us, we have the right to know. It's too bad Woodward did not pay attention to that. If they say one thing in private and the opposite in public, we have the right to know. Woodward did not respect that right. If they conspire against us, as Bush and Blair did over um, Iraq, then pretend to be Democrats, Moldy, we have the right to know. It is this morality of purpose that so threatens the collusion of powers that want to plunge much of the world into war and wants to bury Julian aside, uh, Julian alive in Trump's fascist America. In 2008, a top secret U.S. State Department report described in detail how the United States would combat this new moral threat. A secretly directed personal smear campaign against Julian Assange would lead to, quote, exposure and criminal prosecution, unquote. The aim was to silence and criminalize WikiLeaks and its founder. Page after page revealed a coming war on a single human being and on the very principle of freedom of speech and freedom of thought and the democracy. The imperial shock troops would be those who called themselves journalists. The big hitters of the so-called mainstream, most especially the quote liberals unquote, who mark and control the perimeters of dissent 
And that is what happened. I have been a reporter for more than 50 years, John Pilger says, and I have never known a smear campaign like it. The fabricated character assassination of a man who refused to join the club, who believed journalism was a service to the public, never to those above. Julian Assange slammed his persecutors. He produced scoop after scoop. He exposed the fraudulence of wars promoted by the media and the homicidal nature of America's wars, the corruption of dictators, the evils of Guantan Guantanamo. He forced us in the West to look in the mirror. He exposed the official truth tellers in the media as collaborators, those I would call a Vichy journalists. Hey, Chuck Todd, that's you. None of these imposters believed Assange when he warned that his life was in danger, that the, quote, sex scandal, unquote, in Sweden was set up and an American hellhole was the ultimate destination. And he was right and repeatedly right, says John Pilger. The extradition hearing in London this week is the final act of an Anglo-American campaign to bury Julian Assange. It is not due process. It is due revenge. The American indictment is clearly rigged. It is a demonstrable sham. So far, the hearings have been reminiscent of their Stalinist equivalents during the Cold War. Today, the land that gave us Magna Carta, Great Britain, is distinguished by the abandonment of its own sovereignty in allowing a malign foreign power to manipulate justice and by the vicious psychological torture of Julian, a form of torture as uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but Niels Melzer, uh, the UN expert, has pointed out, that was refined by the Nazis because it was most effective in breaking its victims. Every time I have visited Assange in Belmarsh prison, I have seen the effects of this torture. When I last saw him, he had lost more than 10 kilos in weight. That's about 22 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. 2.2 pounds in a kilo. His arms had no muscle. Incredibly, his wicked sense of humor was intact. As for Assange's homeland, Australia has displayed only a cringing cowardice as its government has secretly conspired against its own citizens who ought to be own citizen, who ought to be celebrated as a national hero. Not for nothing did George W. Bush anoint the Australian Prime Minister his, quote, deputy sheriff, unquote. It is said that whatever happens to Julian Assange in the next three weeks will diminish, if not destroy, freedom of the press in the West. But which press? The Guardian? The BBC? the New York Times, the Jeff Bezos Washington Post? No, the journalists in these organizations can breathe freely. The Judases on The Guardian, who flirted with Julian, exploited his landmark work, made their pile, then betrayed him, have nothing to fear. They are safe because they are needed. Freedom of the press now rests with the honorable few the exceptions, the dissidents on the internet who belong to no club, who are neither rich nor laden with, uh, with Pulitzers, but produce fine, disobedient, um, and moral journalism, those like Julian Assange. Meanwhile, it is our responsibility to stand by a true journalist whose sheer courage ought to be inspiration to all of us who still believe that freedom is possible. Um, I salute him. And I salute Julian Assange too. And I hope that you do um, as well. Um, he deserves it. He, Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Others, too. They all deserve it.
Next. A piece in dandelion salad. Chris Hedges, Daniel Ellsberg, and James Goodale. The Assange extradition and the war on uh, journalism. So here there's a quote by Chris Hedges from Popular Resistance on September 9th. The attempt to extradite Julian Assange to the United States prosecution is a war against the freedom of the press and our right to know. If the prosecution of Assange under the Espionage Act occurs, it will define journalism for the 21st century. No journalist or publisher who exposes war crimes or corruption will be safe. The speakers here are Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers and uh, Chris Hedges. Okay, I'm not going to play this because generally it takes too long to, uh, to play things. But uh, you have a link to the article, and you can play it for yourself. It's a YouTube video, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is okay, a YouTube video. There's also an article that's been linked to by Kevin Gostazola, who is from Shadowproof. That seems to be, that one seems to be behind a paywall, so I'm going to have to leave it for you, but Kevin does pretty good stuff, so I'm just going to leave that for you. There's a link to it in the dandelion salad uh, piece. So, I'm going to move from there. And I'm going to go to a tribute to Kevin Zeese. Also appeared in Counterpunch. This is a tribute written by David uh, Swanson, who worked with Kevin uh, for a number of years on issues okay, of war and peace and foreign policy, and also um, in the Green Party. They both were part of the Green Party shadow cabinet of Jill Stein. This is a picture of Kevin in uh, Dundalk, Maryland, in 2006, which, of course, was 14 years ago when Kevin uh, was only 50. And Dave Swanson starts off, Kevin Zeese was a major, constant, reliable presence in the movement for peace and justice. He was writing, editing, online, and all forms of communication. He organized events, protests, occupations. Um, he risked arrest. He ran for office. He was an attorney and used the courts and shared his expertise. He thought independently. 
he acted collaboratively. He maintained good relations with those he disagreed with. Even those he disagreed with over that most um, but disagreeable of topics in a collapsing in an oligarchy, specifically elections. Kevin and his partner in recent years, Margaret uh, Flowers, who, if I'm not mistaken, has been his partner for perhaps uh, 10 years, combined art, civil resistance, um, um, music, journalism, uh, radio, and coalition building to cross um, issue areas and energize. Losing Kevin is a horrible blow. But nobody can say that he didn't put his time to good use. Nobody can say that. If thousands followed his lead, we wouldn't have a world transformed. Nobody can say that he didn't make a major difference, exposing injustice, and changing public policy and culture for the better. When I type in Zeese, quote unquote, on davidswanson.org, I find this um, the radio show. Take a listen, and there's a link there to a radio show. Then I find an old announcement of a shadow cabinet with myself as Secretary of Peace and Kevin as Attorney General. Uh, um, and by the way, Margaret Flowers was the Secretary of HHS in that cabinet, if I recall correctly. <laughs> I find plans for event and joint statements, pages and pages and pages of them. I find that Kevin was part uh, was part of a group that was protecting an embassy against a coup. Um, that he was part of occupying Washington, D.C., legalizing drugs, of opposing um, at NATO, meeting with the U.S. Institute of Peace, to ask them to support peace, rallying in support of numerous whistleblowers, speaking out powerfully for countless causes. Kevin was an environmentalist, an anti-racist, a socialist, a war abolitionist, a poverty um, abolitionist. He supported world beyond war from the get-go and served on our advisory board, not only in name, but actually strategizing and advising wisely and creatively. Kevin took on the plutocrats, the lobbyists, the Chamber of Commerce, the weapons dealers, the politicians, and the pundits, fairly and fearlessly. Going back through my own website, I see how many times I interviewed him, and he interviewed me. And I recall how many other people he influenced. But looking up Zeese uh, um, on worldbeyondwar.org is overwhelming, a recent classic. Guaido's failed foreign tour ends with a flop by Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers. And another, um, Iran wants peace. Will the U.S. allow peace with Iran? By Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers. More. Korea is negotiating peace treaty and end to demilitarize zone by Kevin Zeese. See Kevin's portrait and bio on Americans who can tell uh, um, who tell the truth. All these things I've just been citing are linked to in this article. But perhaps best of all, watch this video of a speech that Kevin made at World Beyond Wars conference in Toronto in 2018, in which Kevin discusses his understanding of how to build a social movement that succeeds. Listen carefully. And for those who don't know, David Swanson is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He's executive director of World uh, uh, Beyond uh, War.org and campaign coordinator for RootsAction.org. 
His books include War is a Lie. He blogs at davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. He hosts Talk Nation Radio. He is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the U.S. Uh, Peace Memorial Foundation. Longer bio and photos and videos here. And by the way, he's also a professor at uh, uh, the University uh, uh, the University of uh, Virginia at uh, Charlottesville, if I am not mistaken. Which last time I looked, okay, I was not mistaken in saying that. I don't know if he's still a professor there, but since he's been there for a long time, I suspect he still is. Anyway, there's a link to longer bio and photos, and you can follow him on at um, the David uh, C. N. Swanson and Facebook. Okay, so I will stop sharing that. Okay, I will return now to your comments and see what you've had to say. Kay says, hi, all glad to see you. Reporting on deck squabs, squabs. Laura says, hi, all. Alvaro says, watch out, you're going to snorkel that wine out of your nose by laughing. <laughs> Carmen says, Avril says, I think uh, that uh, that Woodward is a Russia gator, not that that has um, uh, um, very much to do with anything, but uh, it blew me. Yeah, Woodward is a Russia gator, I think. Barbara says, the tapes are scandalous, but Woodward sitting on them is also scandalous. Yes, but of course Trump is more scandalous because, as I said, he is responsible for not taking care of COVID when he knew very well how bad it was going to be. Kay says, hi, okay, to Evelina, um, Evelina. And Carmen says, uh, Orangio Stupido is the virus COVID-2020. And Barbara Wernick says, God Almighty. Evelina says, Hi, Kay. And Carmen says, And his base don't care one iota. Barbara says, um, He let Americans die. With his policies, he caused Americans to die. He caused Americans to die. He instituted a policy of specifically letting the governors fend for themselves, compete for resources. He followed a policy that he was not going to invoke the Defense Production Act to help us out. He followed policies to undermine his experts and what they wanted to do. He actively torpedoed us acting collectively as a nation to limit the number of deaths we would sustain. If he had acted in this way in the context of war to let our enemies off the hook, we would now be charging him for treason. Carmen says, yes, of course. He meant some kind of off-droner panic. 
Even as we already knew this, I realized the population as a whole did not, though. We may have known it, but we did not have direct and explicit proof. It's not the same thing. We knew, he knew, he knew how serious it was. We knew he was lying about it, but we inferred that knowledge. In this case, there's no inference. We hear him saying it. That is different. It's not about us knowing. It's about him saying, him admitting, him removing all doubt. His supporters now having to parrot his excuse. He was trying to avoid panic, but they can no longer say he didn't know it was going to be so serious. They can no longer say that because he's admitted that he did know. That's different. Okay, so stocks were down again today. I saw they were shoveling money in it early, but it didn't help much. Alvaro says, Trump is a real, mag a real malignant narcissist. Narcissist, yes. Okay, says, listening to Moving for a People's Party along with this, how is the MPP doing? Avro says, imagine if people hadn't followed their intuition and stayed home even when the economy reopened. It would be that much worse. If we had done what Trump had wanted us to do, it would have been that, fully done that. It would have been that much worse. We would be at 250000 now, undoubtedly. Dolores says, shares, thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Avro says, so many families are sitting around the kitchen table. Um, they're missing a loved one, lost to COVID, like the six-year-old uh, little princess in Florida a week ago. Her family was one of the caravan walkers from South America. Kay says, shared. Avro says, and COVID is a horrible death. Avro says, he's the number one murderer by proxy. He is. Evelina says, China, oh, by the way, if you're going to call him okay, a murderer by proxy, you also have to keep in mind that he's failed to pass a Medicare for All bill, and it has worked to sabotage the Affordable Care Act, Care Act killing even more people due to lack of insurance. So on a per year basis, he is added to Obama's 356000 between 2010 and 2016. So Trump is a much bigger murderer by proxy than Obama was. Evelina says, China has sent their vaccine to Peru. Hope it helps. I'm surprised uh, that they're accepting aid from China. I mean, why didn't they go to Cuba? They probably could have gotten a very similar, if not the same vaccine. Avril Mano says, 500,000 are forced to flee um, Oregon due to the fires. Gee, I have to see uh, whether Matt Waldy was, has a problem. Avril says, and Barr would have Jehovah arrested. Our says, why didn't uh, Woodward come out with this info earlier? He's showing his selfish um, petticoats as well. Evelina says, someone from there with whom I'm acquainted says, unusual east wind event helped to propagate the fires. Where are the fires, okay, in Oregon? Are they around the Portland area or in other areas of Oregon? Kay says, Michael E. Mann, climate scientist, was a guest on Hartman's show today talking about it all. People will be making a mass movement out of those states soon, I bet. I have a Facebook friend out there trying to stay safe. Hope he doesn't lose his property there. Me too. Barbara says, uh, Woodward had an obligation to the public. He betrayed that. I think he did. I think he did. And Charles Wright says, I bet Biden is so happy that this happened. He thinks it's going to help him. The progressives are not going to vote shit for brains, Biden. It still may help him. He may get some more Republican shit for brains voting for him. 
Pavlo says, unusual east wind. Uh, so that's Agov Twitler spewing lies. Evelita says, it's a blend of factors that made fire spread, but climate is the principal reason, which means the fires there will continue. And the barber said, he had tapes, no interpretation. Kay says, I shared the interview on my page if you want to listen to it. Thank you, Kay. Alvaro says, who? Uh, Woodward? Evelina says, Alvaro There were other factors, but the vastness of the fires have to do with uh, climate events. Alvaro says, Schmancy Nancy is complicit too for continuously letting things slide. She is. I wonder what she has to say about the R and sky over San Francisco. Maybe she wants to change the words to the song. I left my heart in San Francisco, high on a hill, an orange sky. There we go. Evelina says events. Donald Trump is doing a mengala. He behaves like the type that enjoys death and suffering. Barbara says, Trump, <laughs> I heard just a, I just heard Bonnie groan. <laughs> Trump doesn't even get what he exposed. How is this possible? Yeah, he doesn't even get what he exposed. He thinks it's perfectly acceptable to put forward the excuse. I thought there was going to be a panic, a panic. Kay says, Barbara, you can't fix stupid, as my old daddy told me many years ago. Barbara says, Woodward still needs to answer for complicity. Yes, but number one is number one. Woodward needs to answer for complicity. Trump needs to answer for doing the dirty deed. Alvaro says, Scaramucci said DT will resign soon, so Pence will pardon him. Yeah. Yeah. If Pence agrees to pardon him, maybe on the day DT resigns, Pence needs to be impeached by the House. Put that in McConnell's lap. After all, do you think Pence didn't know the real truth? You think Trump didn't tell him? Evelina says, um, Avril Mano, ha ha, no, I trust my friend on that. Avril says, God, I want to cry. Kay says, hate to see him pardoned, but we'll be glad to see him gone. He'll still be subject to prosecution in New York State. Pence can't pardon him for that. Evelina Aponte says Avril just cracking jokes to keep from being sad. As Adlai Stevenson said, because I'm too old to cry, but it hurts too much to laugh. Evelina says Avril Mano. Kay says he can't be pardoned from New York charges. Yes, he can, but not by the president of the United States. He has to be pardoned by the governor of New York, who I don't think is going to pardon him. Because it was touch and go there for a while with Andrew Cuomo's own brother. who might never have contracted COVID at all if Donald Trump had taken the decisive action that we had a right to expect. As Americans, we had a right to expect decisive action on the part of our president. And what we got was lying instead and letting the governors fend for themselves so he would not be blamed. Barbara says, uh, yes, Americans died. 
a journalist knew the government was withholding information. He did not reveal it due to a book sale. Is he complicit in the crime? I say yes. I say yes, too. He's complicit in the crime. I was, oh, wait, I may be wrong about Scaramucci. It may be Mr. Cohn said that. Sorry, damn headaches. Evelina Pond said Assange did not withhold information. Look what happened to him. Yes, that's right. He did not withhold information. Now, the crime is obviously not withholding information from the public. We need to change that. We need to make withholding information a crime. Avril says, that's excellent news. I read something that mentioned that the reason Donald Trump is trying so hard to occupy the White House, even if he loses, because lawsuits and criminal charges await him when he loses. And Kay says, a movement for a people's party is already building a good third party. Well, they're building a lot of members right now, and the platform is good, and there's a lot of promise, but they have yet to run their first candidate. And Barbara says, what? What are you trying to connect here? And Avril says, Julian was speaking back against the American accuser in court, but the judge suppressed him. And the judge suppressed him for yelling. And Kay says, Julian has already been through enough hell for speaking the truth, actually publishing the truth, but that's all right. Avril says, Julian Assange has two kids. It broke my heart when I found that out the day before yesterday. Kids he hasn't seen in I don't know how many years. Barbara Wernick, okay, I don't think he might have been waiting for an opportune moment to reveal info like you say, but he was also waiting for proximity to elections and Trump's uh, um, weakness at the moment. Now, is it possible to get a vitriolic taste in your mouth every time you hear Donald Trump's name? Yes. Evelina Pont book sales um, um, American Lives, a non issue. Fact. Evelina says, I don't doubt it. And Barbara says, Evelina Pont, the truth, profit over people always wins. That is true among some people. Profit over people always wins. I don't know if that was the case when Woodward was young, but over the years, I think that has happened to him. Avril says, I wonder what Woodward would think if he got COVID or someone close to him died from it. Maybe someone close to him already has. We don't know that. Kay says, we have no freedom of the press anymore, shake my head. Very few investigative uh, reporters. Avril says, exemplary topics in balance tonight, Dr. Joe. Thank you, Avril. Evelina says, former Australian Prime Minister had his own security forces involved in events that Assange exposed. Australia is part of NATO, isn't it? I don't know. Is Australia part of NATO? Why would Australia be part of NATO? I think Australia is part of CETO, Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. I don't think it's part of NATO. If it is, I'd be very surprised. That's a question. We should Google that. Is Australia a part of NATO? What's Australia doing in the North Atlantic? Canada is a part of NATO. Kay says, I would think so, Evelina Pond. Avril says, wish Tom Cruise and the Mission Impossible team could break into Belmarsh and take Julian to a safe place. <laughs> Steve says, you would add Susie Dawson, New Zealand journalist exiled in Russia and friend of Julian to that list. Thank you, Steve. I could. Avril says, all this is because 
HRC was exposed by WikiLeaks. Well, if, if, if all this was just because of that, then why wouldn't Trump simply go along with it? I thought that was one of the reasons why I used to think WikiLeaks was great. Steve says, five eyes, yes. In the NATO, I don't think so, but maybe. I will say all this because WikiLeaks exposed HRC and DNC cheating. No, again, Trump would have liked that. It's because WikiLeaks has opposed, has exposed some other things. Evelina says Australia part of coalition forces in that region. Yes, absolutely. And Avril says uh, Kevin should have been president. Kevin would have made a great president. Steve says and Podesta's pedophilia. Evelina says, Steve Wolfbrand, Australia, part of coalition forces in that region. Avril says, China is joining Iran and Russia in military uh, exercises. I know. Steve says, Australia is also a member of the Five Eyes, an informal group of five English-speaking nations that share intelligence, mostly subservient to the CIA. Yes, I know. And Barbara Wernick says, hoo-ha, treason, it's real, he said it. Avril says, so clearly Pelosi knows about Trump being the angel of death, but she still hasn't mentioned um, impeachment. She's very far removed from impeachment. I mean, right now, She's working on either getting the kind of deal she wants from the Republicans um, on the next round of uh, relief for of COVID or getting the ability to blame them for not producing any relief uh, at all. That's what she's working on. She doesn't have any attention span for anything else. Kay says, the movement for a People's Party seems to be doing the work to organize and get on ballots now. Yes, yes, they were. Actually, in 2016, they had done work to organize and get um, on ballots. But they never followed through with any candidates and campaigns. Steve says, seems like it. I was watching um, MPP. Um, earlier. Evelina says, Peru, not on the best terms with Cuba, though, Dr. Joe. Uh, remember, they have a right-wing um, um, government. Yes, I, I did recognize that. But uh, you know what? If the right-wing government had asked for Cuban doctors, Cuba would have sent them. Cuba would have sent them. Last time I looked, um, but China doesn't have a right-wing government um, either. Well, maybe in some perspectives, they're a right-wing government, but from the Cuban point of view, they're not a right-wing government. <laughs> and from our point of view, they're not a right-wing government either. Evelina says in Peru, Avril says, yes, you've read my mind about him. Denying the sick expanded Medicare for all during a proven deadly pandemic. Evelina says, good news. Barbara says, laugh out loud. Kay says, laugh out loud. Sing it, Joe. Barbara says, uh, DT will never resign. I'm not expecting DT to resign either.
Hmm. Okay, let me see. Where am I? Sorry, I've lost my place here for a moment. I'll be back. Oh, yeah, Democrats turned down the recovery bill today. I wonder what reasons uh, they gave. Uh, the recovery bill does almost nothing for nobody. It's not a recovery bill. Those are the reasons they gave. It's only a $300 billion bill. Uh, okay, it was dead on arrival. And before you focus on the Democrats rejecting the recovery bill of the Republicans, remember that those same Republicans rejected the HEROES Act, which was the recovery bill of the Democrats, which is a $3.4 trillion recovery bill. That is far more of a recovery bill than the crap the Republicans were offering. Avril says, so much to absorb. Kay says, they know they have to do the organization first. They will in 2024. They got to run people in 2022. They can't wait for 2024. They got to have candidates in 2024. Avril says, so much to absorb. It's overwhelming, and yes, it too keeps me up at night, sigh. And Kay says, me too, Avro, among more personal problems. And Avro says, oh yeah, Democrats turned down the recovery bill today. I wonder what reasons they get. And Avro said, what is Bonnie up to? She's watching on the other computer, I believe, and listening. And Kay says, um, nothing in it for people, just for corporations. And Avril says, are you guys going as Bonnie and Clyde for Halloween? No. <laughs> no, we can't go out for Halloween this year. Can't go out for uh, Halloween. Remember, no Halloween t this year. Halloween is verboten. Hmm? I heard Jim's thing. I was on the other machine. <laughs> oh, did you know that Donald Trump used the song, Do You Hear the People Sing, in a rally in Miami under the parody title Les Deplorables? Les Deplorables. Les deplorable. <laughs> a response to Hillary Clinton's controversial basket of deplorables uh, label. I did not know that. I did not know that Donald Trump would dare to do that. Her what she Mm -hmm. Any more comments?
I will say, oops, forgot. Yep, no Halloween. Okay, folks. Okay, so I don't think it's canceled in Ohio yet. Not sure, though. I don't know if it's officially canceled here in Virginia, but I, our governor has been relatively cautious about taking chances when it comes to COVID. I'm going to say good night. I'm going to sing us out. <laughs> Do you hear the people sing? Singing the songs of angry men. It is the music of the people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums. There is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. <laughs> Barney's <laughs> making faces at me. <laughs> I think that's enough for tonight. Thank you for coming. I'll see you with a Q&A. <laughs> I'll see you with a Q&A on progressive short takes um, on Saturday. <laughs> I posted another progressive short takes today, and I'll post another one tomorrow. So, Avro says, I don't know, but I'd like to stuff that orange turkey with glass and metal shavings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that's a novel suggestion. <laughs> okay, good night, folks. <laughs>